Okay, I think we are through with the technical difficulties and can move to the substantive part of the program. Thank you all for coming. My name is John Torpy. I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies here at the CUNY Graduate Center. For those of you who may not be familiar, the CUNY Graduate Center is the PhD granting part of the CUNY system. I mean, there are other PhDs occasionally granted elsewhere, but mainly if you get a PhD from the City University of New York, you get it from us. And I'm proud to be director of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. And I think given this evening's uh, topic, uh, I think it may be worth saying that, uh, you know, we sort of take seriously the fact that uh, we're named for uh, Ralph Bunch, who's a name that may not be familiar to you, um, probably is not well known, particularly to people under about 50. Uh, but he was, among other things, an international civil servant, an undersecretary general of, of the UN, who uh, won the first, was the first black man to win a, a Nobel Peace Prize. And he was awarded that prize for his efforts to mediate the Israeli-Palestinian dis dispute in the early, very early days of the United Nations. So it seems very appropriate for us to be uh, co-sponsoring this event. Um, so let me just turn to saying a few words about our speaker whom no doubt many of you already know or know of, uh, and that's why you're here. Professor Mohammed Dayani Daoudi is a political scientist and Palestinian peace activist uh, who believes that there can be an accommodation between Israelis and Palestinians. I think we all have to hope that that's the case. He has persevered in his quest to understand the, the two sides of this Middle Eastern conflict despite the attempt uh, to silence him after he took his class to uh, at Al Quds University to Auschwitz a number of years ago, and that set him on the path that brings him to us this evening. Uh, on March thirteenth, twenty twenty three, a few months ago, Professor Diani received the Simon Wiesenthal uh, Award for Civic Engagement to Combat Antisemitism. More recently, uh, Queens Queens College President. I learned this from my colleague. Eli, uh, Eli Koretny, uh, Queens College President Frank Wu just awarded him the Excellence in Leadership Award for his outstanding contributions to education and, and his service to humanity. This evening's event is co-sponsored by the Academic Engagement Network, the CUNY Alliance for Inclusion, the Hillel at Baruch College City, City College, John Jay, Pace, School of Visual Arts, Fordham, FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology, and the New School. Uh, also the Bell Zeller Scholarship Trust Fund uh, and the CUNY Academy for the Humanities and Sciences, and of course, the Ralph Bunch Institute. So let me turn it over to Professor Diani, who is going to address the topic this evening, advocating empathy and reconciliation in the midst of conflict. Thanks so much for coming. Good evening. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, first my host for inviting me to be here and for you to have come to listen and to be uh, to be here tonight. Uh, what I'd like to do first is to show uh, two videos of the work we do, which will give you an idea about uh, about me and my work and things, and my background. So, yeah. Didn't, sound isn't coming in. As a young adult, Tajani was a Palestinian revolutionary and an anti American activist, but his views began to change when he came to the U.S. as a graduate student. To me, it was like getting out of the cave because here 
academic source to different ideas, to democracy, practice, culture. It was uh, an eye opening and it was a very unique experience. Inspired by American values, Ajani went on to create the first American studies department in the Arab world at Al Quds University in Jerusalem, where he taught a more balanced view of the United States. He also founded a non political movement called Wasatia, which means middle ground. Wasatia promotes tolerance and moderation and teaches how those values are reflected in Islam. Both his work with Wasatia and his teaching of American studies reflect Dajani's belief in the importance of empathy for reaching reconciliation. Last year, he bravely took a group of Palestinian students to the Auschwitz death camp in Poland. For me, it was very important because I thought that uh, this uh, topic is a taboo and people did not want to talk about it, did not want to learn about it because there is this misconception that it is a Zionist narrative. I felt that it is very important that we cannot uh, remain ignorant about this and then we should teach our students what really happened and try to focus on uh, this topic from the human perspective. He was forced to resign after a months-long campaign of death threats, campus riots, and intimidation. Dajani is now working in the United States to pursue his dream of a moderate Middle East. Actually, I uh, got introduced to the Institute when I met uh, Dr. Robert Sarto. And uh, we developed a friendly relationship. And uh, then this uh, helped me see the work he is doing. And um, I thought what he uh, did regarding the Holocaust and uh, how he studied uh, what Muslims contributed during the Holocaust. And so I thought that's exactly what we are doing, We're trying to build bridges between communities. And so we co-authored together an article that was titled, Why Should Palestinians Learn About the Holocaust? During my um, stay here, I was shocked to find uh, how much people here learn uh, what a cultural and enriching environment it is. Also the colleagues around who have so much knowledge and so much experience and are contributing to all this good work. In that sense, I was also very impressed by the fact that I, as a Palestinian, is part of it, as well as many others who have come before me. I think that it is very important. This is, I think, part of what we promote in Wasatia, uh, to be able to know the other and to be able to understand the other and to learn about the other. At a time of unprecedented violence and extremism in the Middle East, Hajani is a voice of moderation. I'm trying to fight extremism, I any mean, political uh, force might work on the short run, but on the long term, it is ideology which is important. And that's why I believe that we need to promote moderation in order to have an ideology that will find the extremist ideology. Okay. We'll send one later. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank
Mm -hmm. No, 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 Right, all the way to the right, all the way to the right, all the way next to the next to the garbage. This one, open it. Click it. No, next one, next one, next one. There you go. And just end safari at the right, at the left, top hand side. There you go. That's it. <laughs> now. I'm uh, accustomed actually to these technical problems that we face from time to time. We depend on technology, and yet we are slaves to the to this technology, and uh, not always does it work. Uh, yesterday, uh, I was saying that President Wu was um, has very kindly uh, presented me with an award. And I posted it on the uh, Facebook, my Facebook, my page on Facebook. Usually, when I do that, people don't, Palestinians ignore Israelis' support, but most Palestinians do ignore. And uh, however, I was um, surprised to see that. Uh, there was a very big response uh, so far to the uh, to the award, 114, which is very high to me, regarding and more than 60 uh, comments. But one of the, the one of the comments that uh, was of interest to me is a comment by a Palestinian, and uh, in that comment. He was saying, uh, and I want, and I want to quote him. He, he said, uh, uh, con uh, "Such such recognition by an American educational sorry." Such recognition by an American educational institution is an honor to all Palestinians. My sincere congratulations to you, doctor, and best regards, Hamzi Al-Alami. Uh, what is the significance of this message? The significance of this message is that this isolation in which I have been going through for the last 10 years is breaking down and Palestinians are starting to recognize the work I'm doing and the message I'm doing. Because in the, the whole, and you know, working in midst of conflict, you will face all kinds of challenges. And one of the challenges that I have been facing is either that people would say that wasatiya moderation is soft, it will not work, or that this is normalization with the enemy. My response is simple. Normalization, usually uh, in order to empower occupation is bad, but normalization to end the occupation, why should you have problems with that? And so that's part of the challenge that we, we have. And it's very unfortunate that uh, this, uh, work that we are doing uh, is not really reaching the masses, the people, in the sense that, okay, we are in a cycle of conflict. What do you want to do? Do you want to continue this cycle of conflict? We have been killing each other and uh, demolishing. Uh, they, were, they, are, they are killing us, we are killing them, we are stopping them, we are stopping them. They are stepping up. Okay, when will it end? How will it end? Now, usually, 
uh, reconciliation takes place uh, post-conflict, and it is easy to do. Or you go to conflict resolution. But uh, here, it's not a conflict that needs to be resolved. And that's part of the problem that we are facing. We need to look at it and see how can we uh, find a way where we can live together. We can, uh, I uh, find it so difficult for people not to understand this simple logic, this simple thing that, what is it that you want? You want to keep in this cycle forever or do you want this cycle to end? Okay, our parents, we inherited this conflict from them. Now the question that faces me is, what do I want to have my children inherit? Do I want them, do I also want them to inherit this conflict or do I want them to inherit peace and prosperity? And that's where I uh, and I'm trying to find new ways you know, to deal with this. And it is so difficult. One of the things that I noticed is religion. Religion suddenly, we were talking about politics before, and suddenly religion emerged a part of the part of this uh, conflict. Now, how to deal with the religion, how to shift religion from being part of the problem to becoming part of the solution. And particularly that today on both sides, people are living in, the, in, the, in this dilemma. I, uh, it was back in uh, uh, 2006. It was late in 2006. It was Ramadan and it was a Friday morning. And I was standing at the balcony of my office, overlooking an Israeli checkpoint, which, near, which is near our office. And hundreds of Palestinians were pushing against the checkpoint, wanting to go to Jerusalem to pray. And uh, the Israeli soldiers were pushing them back because they didn't have permits. And uh, uh, and they were, and the Israeli soldiers were throwing at them tear gas, and they were. Uh, it, it was becoming uh, very, uh, very, very tense. And I assumed that the Israelis will shoot at them uh, eventually, and it will be a media event. However, I noticed that uh, tension cooled down, and things went a little bit back to normal. And uh, when I checked, the Israeli soldiers or the Israeli officer at the checkpoint made a deal with the people in which they brought, the Israelis brought buses, allowed the people to cross, they checked them, took their IDs, and then the buses took them to Jerusalem to pray. And, uh, and in this way, in the confrontation was avoided. The Palestinian prayed, took the buses back to the checkpoint, got their IDs and went home. And every Friday, this that Ramadan, that took place. So to me, I was observing this, and it was an inspiring moment, because I thought, this is, I teach game theory, and in game theory, this is a win-win situation. The Israelis had not, it was a winning, uh, they won in the sense that no terrorism took place, at the same time, they, they, they avoided this confrontation of killing people and having a media event. At the same time, Palestinians went to Jerusalem to pray and uh, came back. And these Palestinians were moderate because if they would not have been moderate, they would not have accepted to negotiate with the Israelis that deal. And so to me, I asked myself, uh, who represent them? They are religious, they are moderate, not extremists. So who represent them? In Palestine, we have 10 religious movements, which is extremists, does not believe in reconciliation, believe in jihad to end, to, to end the state of Israel, and believe that there is no compromise, and it is a war between Muslims and Jews. 
and uh, uh, and there are 30 other secular movements, but the monopoly of religion is left to the extremists. So that's how I started a movement I called Wasatiya. And Wasatiya is basically from the Quran because I wanted to use the Quran as the medium between me and the people to reach out to them. And so it is in Al-Baqarah Surah, the second chapter of the Quran, uh, there is in verse 142, it says, God will guide you to the right path. In verse 143, it says, And thus we have created you a temperate nation. And in this way, I use that slogan to be the emblem for our party in order to promote a movement, uh, a movement ahead. Now, that verse 143 in Al-Baqarah Surah is exactly in the middle. Al-Baqarah Surah is made of 286 verses. And that verse is 143 to indicate what symbolism God wants us to know. What does it mean and how, how, it, how to lead us, to how to explain it. Although extremists explain it totally different, saying that it means that Muslims are middle between Jews who killed prophets and the Christians who made their prophet of God, the Muslims did not do it either. So that's it meant in the middle, which is totally wrong in the sense of how you interpret the meaning, the Islamic meaning from the Quranic version, from the Quranic verses. So basically, the idea that I had is to promote a culture of moderation within the Palestinian society, so that this culture of moderation will pave the way for reconciliation and the reconcil in midst of conflict. And the reconciliation in midst of conflict will usher in negotiations in good faith. And the cycle goes on from negotiations in good faith to uh, peace, to ending the conflict by finding a settlement that will a uh, win-win situation for both, and at the same time, eventually ending this conflict. I feel that uh, unless we do that, it will be, we will continue going because the politicians are not interested in peace. They are interested in the status quo, things to remain the same. Small parties in Israel are now in power. They would never have been in power if there was peace. And people voted for peaceful parties, or parties with peace agenda. Now, on the other side, we have also with the Palestinian Authority. We have the same issue. They want the status quo because they don't want elections. They are afraid of elections, afraid to lose power. And so the politicians, on both sides are satisfied with the status quo. Now, the problem is what the people want. In reality, both people want peace, whether it is the Israeli people or the Palestinian people. However, both people are afraid of each other and do not trust each other. And that's part of the problem. And how to solve this problem? So my focus, is that if I can put the past behind, if I can put the present behind, and, and call this zone, but I will call it a conflict zone, and move from this conflict zone to a solution zone. So whenever people are talking to me about the past, they did this, they did that, blame game, and dehumanization, demonization of the other. I don't deal with that. Whenever they talk about the present, they killed, they did, then I also cannot, do not deal with that. I deal with solutions. You have a solution, let's not sit down and talk. Let us have not a monologue, but a dialogue. And in this dialogue, I don't want to focus on the past, I don't want to focus on the present. I want to focus where we are going. What, how do we want to get there? So I, I don't want to be uh, Alice in the land of wonder, wonder, wonder and wonderland. 
where she comes to the uh, to the cat and then she asks the cat uh, which road to take and then the cat will tell her where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. Then it doesn't matter which road you take. No, I know where I'm going. I want to establish peace. I want to reach peace. And in this way, I, I, I'm focused on that side. I'm, I'm focused on that. And uh, if you want to come and drag me to the past, oh, the Israelis shot someone. Or the Palestinians did this, or or oh, Haj Amin al Husseini sat with Hitler, or all any, every time I talk, there will be someone there who will come up with something to dig from the past in order to avoid us moving to the future. And that's where we have to be extremely careful. I believe that if we can do that, then we can move ahead. And there is a lot of ignorance between us. The Palestinians don't want to learn about the Israelis, that the, the PA even canceled teaching Hebrew in at schools. And the Israelis do not want to have anything to do with these Palestinians, say, we have this wall between, between us, you are there and we are here. Now, how can I make peace with the other if I don't have dialogue with the other? And so here comes BDS and says, oh, boycott. And we should not talk to each other. And if you talk to, to the other, you are a traitor. And I want to break that. I don't listen to that. I, and, and that's why I'm being branded by different things. And the, the, there was a conference in South Africa. And uh, the conference was about reconciliation and peace. And there were 11 professors with Palestinian, Israeli and Palestinian professor coming to attend the conference and talk about reconciliation. And the South African BDS uh, objected to the presence of Israeli professors and the conference. And they were told that these people are coming here in order to talk peace, to talk reconciliation, but they would not listen. They, they are Israelis, they are part of Israel, Israel is apartheid, and they should not be in this conference, or else we will boycott the conference and we'll make trouble for the for the, for the participants. Office. So the people, and then one of the argument was there are no Palestinians also because there are Israeli Palestinians, but there are no Palestinians from the West Bank. And they said the only one who accepted to come was Professor Dejani, and he's a keynote speaker. And they said, oh, Professor Dejani. He is not a genuine Palestinian. So they erased 500 years of my family in Jerusalem in order because only I do not fit their image of what a Palestinian is, who is, who, or who should be. My question to them was, I wrote an article, I said, and in that sense, and I feel sad that you, people, South, South Africans, Africans, they're not Palestinians, and that you have inherited a big heritage from Nelson Mandela, which is the reconciliation rainbow, and you forget it, and you import our conflict to, to your country. And, uh, uh, and in this way, what is happening to your heritage? It is here, Nelson Mandela, and died thinking that you will carry on his message after his death. And what is happening with you? And so I wrote that in an article that was published in the new, a newspaper there, urging them to adopt reconciliation, to adopt the message of Nelson Mandela and send it to the world and, and make, make, uh, make it their, make it their uh, uh, product and uh, uh, that they would uh, make the whole world, whatever it is, to, to, to come together. And so here, the problem is that we are facing is that we have so much deep-rooted taboos. What is wrong with Palestinians or Arabs learning about the Holocaust? What is wrong with that? And here you are having a human tragedy that took place. Learn about it. 
And what is wrong to uh, including it in your educational curriculum? Now they say, oh, the Israelis have outlawed the Nakba. So we will we should never teach the Holocaust until they uh, go back. And it is not a matter of whether it is what the Israelis are do doing. Don't follow what the other is doing. Don't have this reciprocity. If, if they teach the Nakba, I will teach the Holocaust. That's totally wrong. And think of it, am I doing the right thing or not? Is teaching the, the Holocaust doing the right thing? Okay. If it is doing the right thing, I will teach it. If it's not doing the right thing, I will not teach it. And, but don't think all the time in terms of the other, what the other is doing. And in this way, have this reciprocity between the, the, you and the other. Well, the other might do something that might not be of your interest, but he, he will lead you to it. And, uh, in 1947, the Zionists did not want the partition plan, but yet they accepted it to make you uh, reject it. And you rejected it, and you lost. And in this, in this way, we are keeping this history repeated once and repeated again. And this is part of the problem that we face. And that's why in working for peace in the midst of, of, of conflict, it needs courage in the sense that not to, not to think in terms of what threats that you might have from those who are opponents to you. I look at things in terms of two sides, the extremists and the moderates. Harriman, in her book, The Vocabulary of Peace, she says that the Oslo Accords had, was a landmark. Uh, why? Because for, for the first time, the Oslo Accords, it was, and before Oslo, it was Palestinians against Israelis. Arabs against Israelis, against Jews. After also, it was Palestinians and Arabs and Jews and Israeli for peace against Palestinians and Israelis against peace. And so this is where the difference. I say also that I added that also also had also is a landmark. Why? Because before Oslo, it was Palestinians and Israelis for the big dream, which is to have the whole cake and eat it without the other from river to sea. And Palestinians and Israelis for the small dream, which is sharing the cake rather than eating it. And so here we are thinking in terms of Palestinians and Israeli camp of peace against the Israeli and Palestinian camp, maximalist uh, camp, which is against peace. And so why? Because they want to take the cake and eat it without the other. And so they, what can, what can we do? And this is the problem is that you want the, the land from river to sea, you cannot have it because in reality, there are millions of Palestinians sitting there who will not let them have it and will keep fighting you. And they will not give up, not today and not tomorrow. The same thing, you as a Jew coming here and wanting to build bridges with the others rather than building walls and building power because power does not last no matter what. And as a result, I was seeing the film Golda. And in the beginning of the film, uh, you, you see how much worried they were that they might have, may have lost the war. And in reality, that could have been a possibility if Kissinger did not move in and give them all the weapons they needed and all the support they needed. And, and that's why one should not uh, base his uh, future vision on power, because power does not last. And, but moral power lasts in that sense. And that's where we need to have dialogue between each other. We need to stand up and uh, 
be able to say how we feel. I feel sad when I see Palestinian politicians talking about the past all the time and talking, and then an Israeli in Tel Aviv hears that and says, how can I make peace with these people? And at the same time, there are the Gabirs who actually want one vote here and one vote there. And uh, unfortunately, that people will vote for them in order to put them in power. And uh, But I see this not as a long lasting vision. This is part, this I see it as, that's why I'm optimistic. I see it as part of a, a, a part of a temporary or transitional phase. And the Gaviers will not stay there forever. There will come a time when their time will be over. And, uh, and they depend on fear. Now, our work, if we can demolish the foundations of fear and build, a, build two societies that reach out to each other, and instead of these walls that we have built, we build bridges between us and talk to each other and see the humanity in the other. That's how I shifted from being an extremist to becoming a moderate, because seeing my father being treated by an Israeli doctor who doesn't know him and he doesn't care, he is a Muslim, he's a Christian, he's a Christian, he is a Palestinian, he's a patient, he saw him as a patient. And to me, I thought that that's the human side of the other, I, which I never had seen before. And in this way, I was able to think in terms of moving on with my life. The same time, uh, we took my mother a few years. My father died of cancer after being treated for it for five years by Israeli doctors, and not him, but also Palestinians. I walked in Israeli hospitals, and I saw all these Palestinians. Now, the problem is people tell me, suppose you did not see these people uh, being treated that way. Uh, will you be for peace? And I say, but maybe God had helped me see that <laughs> in order to see the good in the other, in order that my heart shift from being heart of stone to becoming heart of flesh. And so that I can see the humanity in the other. Do I, and can't we say maybe God is guiding us to that? I'm, I'm not religious. I don't pray, I don't fast. Yet I'm leading a, an Islamic movement. And at the same time, I feel that it is very important for me to be uh, to believe and to believe in God. And I do believe in God. And I do believe that uh, God has guided me to do what I'm doing. And in this way, I feel I'm being protected because I could have died a long time ago, not only with the, with the present situation, but with the past situation when I was with Fatah and most of my friends did die in action. And uh, so basically, we are talking about what should we do? What is it that we need to do? I, I thought that when I started Wasatliya in 2007, people were telling me, uh, we want quick solutions. I said, we don't have quick solutions. You have to think in terms of the long term. And I believe in education. And that's where, why I started the American Studies program at Al-Quds University in 2002, in order to build bridges between the American culture and the Palestinian culture. And, and then also when I started this Wasatiya movement, I started it in order also to build bridges between Jews, Christians, Muslims, and other religions. Because I feel it is so important for us to be able to reach out to the other, to feel the agony of the other, the suffering of the other, to show empathy for the suffering of the other, despite the fact he might be your enemy. Because this is the human side of the other. And we have, uh, we have uh, a lot to share. I, when I was in grade one, 
I studied, uh, they taught us a story in grade one about this king walking in the fields and he saw so, so an old man planting an olive tree and uh, he wanted to tease him. So he said to him, old man, do you expect to eat from this old, uh, from, the, from this olive, the fruits of this olive tree it takes hundreds of years, uh, tens of years to, to give fruit. And the old man said, uh, we planted uh, our grandparents planted, we ate, we plan so that our grandchildren will eat. I remember that story all the time, and I kept it in my mind to teach me how to, uh, how to do things. And only 50 years later, a rabbi friend of mine said to me, but Muhammad, do you know that this story is written in the Talmud? And it is from the Talmud. So we share a lot. We have so much in common. And so the only thing is what we need is to have the courage to move on and to say hello and to say how are you and to learn the language of the other and to tell the other, yes, you belong here. Yes, you, you, you have the right to be here. Yes, I respect you. I respect your religion. I, use, I respect your language. Let's move on. And in this way, we are thinking in terms of the future. Uh, I believe that people tell me, how, how can this be done? I started, uh, I, I'm one of the founding members of a PhD program at Europa University in Flensburg, in which on reconciliation. And the idea was that we will bring together Palestinians, Israelis, people from conflict areas to study together and learn together. And so that there will be an elite people who will understand reconciliation, will understand what does empathy mean? What does tolerance mean? He will write books about it. He will write articles about it. He will go back and teach about it. And then also they will have a network among each other, whether they are from Rwanda, from Bulgaria, from Ireland, from Palestine, from Israel, from South Africa. And we bring them together. We are bringing them together. And I believe that. I believe in that. And I'm dedicating my life in order for that program to succeed. And why? Because I feel we need also to learn and to educate ourselves what is, what is empathy, what is uh, Yesterday, a young Palestinian student was upset of my what I said, and she stood up and said, you are brainwashing us. And then she walked out. And I wanted to ask her, what do you mean by the word brainwash? Why am I brainwashing you? Why am I? I'm not forcing my, my ideas on you. I'm telling you my ideas, narrating them. You have your ideas, tell them to me, and we will discuss, and we will talk. I don't, I don't uh, have to, I'm not imposing my ideas on you. At the same time, don't impose your ideas on me. And learn the story from this rabbi, where two Jewish people in conflict came to him. And the first told them his side of the story, and the rabbi told them, you are right. And the second, told him his side of the story, and the rabbi said, you are right. When, once they left, the rabbi's wife was very perplexed. She said, but rabbi, how can they both be right? He said, you are also right. <laughs> so basically, I wanted that student to learn that, because in her passion, in her, she was talking emotion. She, and I want her to become an American not to talk much but Russian. And she is missing that, but I don't blame her because I myself was there. I myself was that emotional. I did not believe in dialogue. And here it is so important for us to be able to create this dialogue, but this it's not a monologue that we talk to each other rather than talk to ourselves. And this is where, this is my message. My message is, we, is that we will 
continue our way, our journey. And uh, uh, I have taken the road uh, less traveled by, but yet I believe in the power of one. I believe that tomorrow, and when you look at things, the moderation ideology will triumph, and the extremist ideology will uh, uh, will lose. It is the same thing like what happened with the struggle between communism and capitalism. Capitalism pros prospered. Why? Because it was for the human being, and it allowed his ingenuity and his abilities and his capabilities to come out. And here, the same thing with moderation. Uh, moderation allows the power of the of the one to come out. And I'm hopeful that one day we will prosper and peace will prevail. Uh, like an, a Jewish uh, proverb says that better a bad peace than a good war. We want to work together so that we can have a good peace and a bad war. Thank you very much. So we have time for you questions. Uh, <laughs> At the beginning, you uh, told us about Facebook and the comment that you've seen, and it's very really apparent from a Palestinian uh, into the very ground And if you can, okay, the question, what is the Indeed, for these past 10 years. Um, there are moments that we thought the chance to be here. But what is going to be happening? To be honest with you, uh, there were times when I lost hope, and I was very desperate. I gave myself, I don't want to be a person. But I don't want to be, but I don't want to do this one. But yet, yeah, I look at the children. And I see them now, and they are here at the school against the uh, for children. And I say, for them, I will protect them. And I will move on. Because no matter what, eventually we should not be one. And like they say, one candle can light darkness better than the main darkness. And then I'm sure that more candles will come on, and people will buy more candles. And uh, so basically, I, I have a strong faith that eventually the good will come, and uh, peace will be will created. And that's my conception. Uh, what do you think of the Israeli democracy for this? That has been going on for the last month. Well, I was asked to speak in one of the rallies, and I refused because I said this is domestic affair. But um, when when you teach hatred, that this hatred first it is against the enemy, and then it is against the brother. It is against the and it starts against an enemy, and then it, uh, it becomes against the neighbor, and then it, it becomes against the brother, and then it becomes against you. And in this way, I, I'm hopeful that those people who are demonstrating would have learned the lesson that next time they go to rather than to Because when they did not go to war, they are only minority to win. And so I'm hoping that the next elections will bring up much more people in order to go from the moderate side, from the from the moderates. And in this way, maybe to try to shift in, in the policy. Because I feel, I feel that the extremists have gone too far. First, it was extremism against the Palestinians. Now, it is extremism against the Iranians. 
and they want to take the power without the other. And so, in this way, I feel that I look at the, uh, the demonstrations positively, hoping that yeah, this will enlighten the voter and uh, encourage people, the community to vote tomorrow for, for people who are for moderation and for peace and for reconciliation. Um, I, I agree with you that we have to go to the community and Christ on the money. But my question is this. When you have a... You hold on a second. The folks at home are going to hear you. Thank you. Okay. When you have, I don't know if you will, a culture, a society, uh, a particular place where little children are being marched through the street with, you know, fake, uh, you know, suicide bomb vests and with weapons in their hands and little girls are screaming, stab, stab, stab the Jew and mothers are standing on the street screaming, I'm proud of my son for being Shaheed, for, for going out and trying to kill Jews. I and mean, where do you go with that to even begin to make change? You know, you can light one candle, you can change one mind. But this is this is a lot of people who, you know, when you talk about brainwashing, this is this is their entire modus operandi is to, you know, to, to go out and kill Jews and kill Israelis and kill even people that they think might be Jews who have to be Italian tourists or blah blah blah. And 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 be proud of this. Uh, it just seems like a huge amount to overcome. Uh, there are more than 2 billion 500 million Muslims. And among them, there are maybe 100,000 or 200,000, or let us say 500,000 extremists. People forget the 2 billion and look at the 50,000 or whatever who kill or ISIS or others and said this is Islam. So basically also, people look at a Palestinian who stabs an Israeli and said these are the Palestinians. But they forget there are more than 5 million Palestinians who are there who really do not support that. But they see that and they think at that jigsaw puzzle, one item, one, one one part of it, and don't see the big picture there. And this is part of the problem. It is the same thing with our problem with the Palestinian and the Holocaust, in the sense that when the Jew look at the Holocaust from the big picture, from the fact that this mean, this has meant, this was aimed at inhalation of a people, of a civilization, of a history, of a culture. Palestinians, when they look at it, they look at the small picture. They see the barbed wires, they see the prisons, they see, they fail to see the big picture which the Jews see, which is this inhalation of a people, or a religion, or a culture, or a civilization. And they only see it. That's where I, I urge you to look at the big picture that this person, the young person, don't blame because he has no job, he has no money, his father does not work, and the occupation is harsh on him. And then he, he doesn't. Even the mother, don't believe that mother which says, ah, I'm giving away my son away. No mother will do that. But they have to do whatever they want to say. They say that for socialization. But can he go to raise a son for 17 years and then he is killed? Oh, yeah, as, if, as if it doesn't matter to me. Never a mother will do that. And it, it's not true. Every mother would love her son to study, to, to become someone, and to go and, and to see and to be proud. And now he becomes a shaheed and he dies, and that's over. And she goes home, and the people after that go home, and she's around there. And
And do you think that she's happy? Because she died? Because he's a martyr? Because he's going to, to happen? I don't know. And, uh, I'm not a mother, but I know. And so I think this is a misperception to think that. To think that people are happy killing. And like they say, and we should not, parents, uh, parents should not uh, bury their sons. It is sons should bury their parents. And so we should live a life. People want a life. They want to live. And uh, whether they are Jews or Muslims or Palestinians or Israelis, everybody, they want to live and they go to have a good life for them and for their children. And so that's what we have to work for. By the way, there are so many things that's happening in Palestine and Israel that people outside do not know. And at the same time, to give you an example, there is this group I supported when they started, which is called Women of the Sun, say a young woman in Beijing. And they are working with Israeli women, women with Jews, despite all the pressure against them not to work with Israelis, of being accused of normalization, of treason. Yet they do work with them. And they are they are standing up and uh, on the 5th of October, they are having a huge march at the Dead Sea, both of them. And, uh, and that's where I feel maybe women, like what happened in Liberia, can play a major role in peacemaking. And uh, it is mothers also who lost sons or who want their sons to be, uh, to study and become uh, something to be counted for. speaking over the last few days has been very moving and compelling. How can your message and your methodology be included in the curriculum that's taught in the UN refugee camps? How can, how can, how can that, I, I'm purposely using the word, you know, okay. um, in this context, um, we can talk about that later. But you've got 5 million Palestinian Arabs in refugee camps. We have what we call the education. Yeah, that's what, so that's what I wanted that's to know. That's exactly what should be done there, where instead of teaching martyrdom, instead of teaching martyrdom and jihadism and having you know, the uh, uh, woman uh, or you know, undermining the woman or uh, but rather to teach uh, uh, compassion, to have stories about, and for instance, part of the problem that I'm having with the Palestinian Authority regarding their curriculum is some of the ridiculous stories that they have, that they teach the children. And for instance, one of the stories is about this woman, Muslim woman coming to this Jewish jeweler, jeweler and then she sits there and he ties her dress and she stands up and the dress falls and she shouts and Muslims come and kill the and kill the, the, uh, the Jew. You know what is the story? I mean, what is are you? I mean, what, what what is the what do you want to teach with that story? Or to say that the Jews poisoned the prophet? There is no evidence for that. Or a lot of these things that I'm opposed within the curriculum. And rather, it should, the curriculum should teach about compassion, about forgiveness, about peace, about reconciliation, about living together, about cooperation. So that's, I think, the role of education. But it cannot happen in the textbooks. I do not, it can, it's not enough that you change the textbooks. That's why you need to change the teacher mind. So, because if the teacher does not believe in what is in the textbook, he will throw him, throw it in the garbage and then teach what he wants to teach. That's why I believe that in higher education, to have a program, and even uh, one of the, uh, our friends asked me, what do you think, that we are having this problem, that at Baruch College, we have the uh, Jews and 
uh, the Muslims outside were refused to come and talk to them. I say, I hope that Baruch College one day will have a center for peace or a center for reconciliation. And then you can bring five Muslim uh, leaders who study to do a PhD, five Jewish, five uh, Christian, five Buddhists, five whatever, and let them all study together here. And then the then these Muslims will bring the other Muslims to come here. And the Jew will bring will bring Jews to, to the other side. And this could be one way to start a dialogue, an interfaith dialogue between them, between all of them. And uh, so this could be one way to, to do it in terms of education. Because you have to have a people in education who are uh, who are yani, teachers, and so that they you can send them back to their community, and then these teachers could uh, start whether they are journals and to be community leaders, and uh, and then this way you can be able to build a better community. Within the within this infected world we live in. I'm I know it's not a good idea. I'm not sure about it. I think I had an idea. And then we talked about the education is hard. Hello, Jazakallah Khair for your, your very interesting talk and the work that you're doing. I just had a simple question on how can a regular person support you, support your organization? Not financially, because I am a PhD student. I missed the question. Uh, I just want to know how to how can we help how can uh, how can I help me? What can I do to your organization? Yeah. What can regular people do? You can start with a Center here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, why not? I'm serious. I'm serious that uh, you can have a, a shelter or a whatever within your community. You can start uh, with any woman and you can bring your friends, like, like the young woman who did that in Bejala and call themselves Woman of the Sun. You can yourself call yourself Woman of the Sun, and this is the chapter of Woman of the Sun here. And you can start with 10, 15 of your friends to get together and build from there. And from there, you plant seeds and uh, it will grow. Uh, don't underestimate your power and your will. And we are more than willing to provide books to instruct whatever it takes to, in order to help uh, build that, that community. Because we need that. And we need to have a group that will uh, be enlightened with this concept of moderation, of wasatiyah, and uh, to carry it on so that you can face the ideology of extremism. And here in the States, I think it is much needed. So that last question was actually a good connection to what I wanted to ask about that. Here in New York City, we have a lot of protests from both sides regularly. And one question I have about it is, what can we do to better facilitate communication between groups that are protesting on either side of the issue in order to try to communicate the message of peace to these groups and try to facilitate a way that we can actually have communication between both sides rather than hostility? I believe mean, that what we need, and I don't see that there, is we can create a third group that will talk values, moral and moral values, in the sense that to create a group, and these people create groups that is really brainwashed into one side against the other. And I feel it is important to create.
created a group that we take higher values. And for instance, instead of being pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, to be pro-peace, be pro-conciliation. And in this way, you overcome the party way and other mind. And so to encourage I mean, like in this university, to encourage uh, to encourage uh, students to form chapters or organizations or groups where to stand up against, against the, the extremists or against, against those who are promoting one product or promoting one idea or promoting things and, and leaving all the others against it. Uh, so it can be, and you, you have to be proactive. That's part of what is what needs to be done. Be proactive. And don't give up to them. Uh, this is very important. So you're next. You're next. Up. Before the last government in Israel, before the current one, had uh, had an Israeli Arab party. The Israeli Arab, and apparently they got quite a bit done. And the Israeli Arabs form one sixth of the country. I don't understand why they don't unite and try to get a significant representation in the Knesset, and they can have quite an influence on the quality of life, and even on the relations of Israel with with the a Palestinian Authority. Why are they? incapable of uniting and electing 15 Knesset members. Given the numbers, they should be able to get 15 or 16 members. The question is, why don't the Arabs unite who are affected with electing members to the Knesset, which he thinks they are demographically should be uh, yeah. possible? We have, we have a problem not only among the Arab Israelis, but also among Palestinians living in Jerusalem, where they do not vote for the municipality of Jerusalem, or they do not take part, which is a big mistake that has been done by the PLO a long time ago, and they don't want to admit it was a mistake. And so they keep on going, because like in the road not taken, that the momentum pushing them despite the fact that they know it is it is, is wrong. And uh, uh, the same thing with the uh, Arab, Arabs uh, from Israel. Uh, because the problem is if they, if the, even the Muslim groups, if they will adopt the concept of Wasatiya, or if they will adopt the, uh, to vote for the election, they will make a difference. But they are, uh, it boggles my mind what these people think and how they think, because they are boycotting the elections, uh, some of them, and in and, and this way, giving, giving the right wing uh, the support to rise up. And uh, so, but, but, uh, I believe it's awareness. There should be more awareness. There should be, and I, I, I blame ignorance and bad education and bad, uh, bad teaching of Islam, bad teaching of, uh, so that they they cannot see the future. They cannot focus on the future. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I, this is related to the previous questions in terms of the curriculum. As you said, uh, the curriculum uh, among the Palestinians is, is very much in many ways anti-Israeli. They, they, they listen thought, uh, to the children. And you said that you would have to change the teachers as well. How do you change the canon? Is there something happening now to the teachers in which they are... They are uh, learn this way of reconciliation or you see them in, 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 keeping apart from it and not teaching the, the future generation moderation and reconciliation that was one question and my other question is i understand that 
uh, with the uh, what's going on with the demonstrations now that they are so massive in Israel. Uh, some of the Knesset uh, members, of the, the other members, have complained that they have not had room to explain themselves, and that it is very limited. The, 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 the protest is against the, the judicial uh, reforms and so on. Is there a way in which you see that these mass demonstrations can also include the, the, your, the reconciliation and moderation that we are talking about, or, or do you think them as two separate uh, issues? Unfortunately, the people in power now are men of war, men of conflict. So they don't see the value of education and they don't appreciate the value of, uh, of education. We, as Palestinians, we had throughout the last hundred years four leaders, unfortunately. One we started with Hajj Amil Husseini, who was an extremist. And then we went to Ahmed Shukari, and then we went to uh, the to Arafat, and then we went to uh, Abbas. And unfortunately, uh, the problem is Arafat was a military person. He couldn't change his uh, uh, skin to become modern. And he, he thought that he wants to be the Salah al-Din, and he wants to liberate Jerusalem. And he wants to, at the same time, and he uh, we lost from that. And so he never focused on education, on the social uh, services for people. He only focused on foreign affairs or, or uh, the money, the economy, how, mu how much the owners are paying, where the money is going, and there was a lot of corruption. And uh, I, uh, the problem is uh, we, uh, and we need a leader who is wise and who is diplomatic and who will focus on education. Arafat, when the teachers came to him to ask him to improve their conditions, he threw them out. And he was very uh, rude to them. And Abbas, listen, even now, the Minister of Education, Marwan Artan, he resigned from the ministry because he felt that uh, they are not, uh, they don't give him the funding that they promised him in order to support the teachers and to support education. And so this is part of what we need. We need a leader who, instead of focusing on siphoning the money outside the country and having his sons and the relatives and people around him uh, taking all the funds, uh, to have this money put in the country, to, put, to build society, reform society, improve the quality of life within society, to be put for the social services, for building hospitals, for building schools. And unfortunately, and that's not the case so far. And that's why we are where we are. I wonder if you'd be interested in commenting on the situation in Gaza. Uh, I can recall Gaza where the borders were open to Israel, one could drive in, drive out without any issues. It's a little different now. Um, do you have any particular thoughts on their situation? It must be terrible for the people there. It's also terrible for people who are getting hit by rockets who come from Gaza. So, Oh, I'm sorry. I'll do this again. I wonder if you if you could just comment on the situation in Gaza. Period. Uh, the situation in Gaza is very sad. It is a prison, and it is very unfortunate that uh, it continues. and But I believe that uh, 
Hamas uh, is changing. I think it is more, uh, it is becoming much more moderate than before. Yet, the problem now might not be Hamas, but the Jihad Islami and the other groups that we are being empowered by outside forces. And uh, that's why I feel very worried about the situation in the West Bank, because Hamas is also uh, building on the uh, failure of the Palestinian Authority to uh, to stand up. And uh, the Americans are worried, and the Israelis are worried that uh, for the elections, saying that they are worried they do not want the elections to take place before because they were worried that Hamas will take over. And uh, as a, an American friend of mine asked me about that issue, I said, how can we support elections when the possibility is so strong that Hamas will win? I, and to me, I think that there was a mistake that was done before in allowing Hamas to run for the elections and empowering Hamas. Why? Because Hamas did not believe in the Oslo Accords, did not support the Oslo Accords. And the elections are based on the Oslo Accords. So why did you allow a party or a group to run for elections when they are against the rules that set up that elections? And so, and this is part of Hamas should not be allowed to run unless they accept the Oslo Accords and they accept the framework. And you cannot allow a group of football players to go on, on the field to play without abiding by the rules of the game. And the rules of the game is the Oslo Accords because this whole system of elections and Palestinian council uh, and government and all that is based on Oslo and on the Oslo Accords. And, and this is where uh, I feel that it's important that Hamas and others should be, uh, should be held accountable to that, rather than allow them to take, to take the goods, the fruits, without really paying the, uh, uh, the, the cost. And, and so this is part of the problem. Thank you. Okay, no more questions. All right, then I wanna bring these proceedings to a close. I found this extremely illuminating and inspiring, and I really wanna thank Mohammed Dajani Daoudi for taking the time to come and speak to us tonight and all of you for your questions and everybody out there online. Thank you for in, uh, bearing with us uh, as we had the technical difficulties. I want to thank Manfred Philo of the CUNY Academy of Arts and Sciences for his support in making this happen and for his technical assistance, which I wasn't expecting to have to, to do, but I appreciate that. And the IT people of the Graduate Center who are no longer with us in in the room. Uh, they're still with us as far as I know. I know it was a little difficult, but anyway, I want to say thanks to all of you. And thanks for coming. I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh,